Yeah, so Newton's laws were that if you don't have any acceleration, then the velocity will not change. So that change could be in terms of direction, that change could be in terms of the value or the magnitude. But if there's no acceleration, then we will not have any change in velocity. So if something is stationary, it will remain stationary, it won't move at all. And if something is moving constant velocity, so by that I mean it is moving in a certain direction and it has a fixed magnitude both of those things should be there and that will make it constant velocity so if you don't have acceleration and it has constant velocity constant direction constant magnitude of that velocity then it will continue to do the same and we do experience that uh, for example we'll talk about terminal velocity later today and that is an example of first law uh, being at play but second law talks about when there is actually there is an acceleration and it tells us it gives a name to what causes acceleration so the idea here is that force which can be any push or pull is what causes things to move so the acceleration that you get is always because there is force applied on stuff and it causes acceleration how much acceleration directly proportional to it so if you apply more force it creates a higher acceleration and if if you apply less force, it creates a lower acceleration and it goes both ways. So if you, if you can see that there is high acceleration, you can assume that there is greater force. Uh, so cars that have bigger engines, they could, they create a higher driving force. So no wonder those cars are usually faster and they accelerate faster. One thing that is a assumption here is that the mass will not change. And in most of daily life stuff, mass doesn't really change. Okay. So that is why we can safely assume that force is directly proportional to acceleration in most cases. Yeah, there are cases that exist where it won't be that case where mass will start to change, especially if you move at speeds that are comparable or closer to the speeds of light or speed of light, which is 300,000, uh, sorry, three into 10 power eight, which is 300 million meters per second. So if something starts to move at speeds that are comparable or even close to that, mass starts to change and we see relativistic effects there, which do mean that this law might be need, might need to be altered a little bit. It doesn't really cease to apply, it just needs to be altered a little bit. Uh, then we know that sum of forces is zero. So we are saying that every action has an equal and opposite reaction, which simply means then whenever you apply force on something, that thing applies the force back at you. So that happens if you, uh, whenever you throw stuff, like if you throw a ball or if you're playing and you hit it with a bat or a racket or whatever, you will experience a recoil. Uh, it happens in guns. Gun design requires that recoil should be uh, absorbed by that gun as much as possible and all that. So we have it there. We also have it wherever, uh, we start to move. So for example, if you're walking or running or even swimming, this, uh, this law is at play over there. We talked about how cars move by pushing the ground backwards and in turn, they move forward themselves. Same for when we walk, we push the ground back. So the ground pushes us forward with the same force. Uh, one thing that is different for this one is that the forces here are on a different object. They're not on the same object. If they were on the same object, we will see second law, which is F equals to MA. So that is where acceleration will be produced. Here, the acceleration is produced because the force is a responsive force or a <coughs> force that is created as a response to the force that is already applied. Then we talked about the idea of net force. Net force is vector sum of all individual forces. So if you have multiple forces and we had three forces in this example, so that's the case. Then we talked about contact forces. Contact forces are wherever two bodies are in contact. So friction is a prime example of that or drag in air or uh, all of those things. For example, when things move in fluids, there is a drag over there. So all of that comes from how much surface area is in contact with the other thing. So we can reduce that by reducing the surface area that's in contact or by making things more slippery. So applying a layer of oil or applying a layer of anything that reduces that friction might help if you want to reduce friction. Similarly, you know that wet surfaces are more slippery because they have that layer of water that reduces the friction. Interesting thing about friction is, which is, is not in O-level syllabus, but I think it's safe to assume, is that friction here 
is directly proportional to the normal reaction that you get. This R, R thing or this N thing, normal reaction. Friction is directly proportional to that. So that means that if you have a greater new uh, normal reaction, the friction will also be greater. The second thing that it de depends on, as you can see over here, this is a direct proportion. So obviously, if you change it to an equation, there's going to be some constant, right? Constant. This constant, we usually call it mu. Uh, so we do write it like this. It's a weird U. We write it, we call it mu. Mu is basically a number between zero and one, which tells us how the friction is changing. We study this in A-levels, but I think it wouldn't harm you to know about it. So the greater the mu, mu isn't really a unit. Mu can be used as a prefix. So mu does mean 10 power minus six, or we read it as micro. So again, it depends on what context you have. Yeah, good link here that you found. So this mu is basically a constant between the surface that you have. So if you have a surface that is rough, it will have a higher mu, which means the friction will be higher. And if you have a surface that is smooth, it will have a lower mu, mu value will be closer to zero, so it will reduce the friction. In surfaces which are really, really rough, the mu approach is one, which means the friction is almost equal to the normal reaction force that you have. What exactly is normal reaction force? It basically opposes the weight of the thing that falls on the surface. And no, second thing about normal reaction is that normal reaction is always perpendicular to the surface. What that means is that if you tilt the surface, weight will still be down. You know that weight is always downwards. So weight is always downwards, but normal reaction is perpendicular to the surface. So if you start to tilt the surface a little bit, this weight will not be like that. Uh, so weight will not be completely canceled out by normal reaction. And that is the reason that things start to move. Let me explain that a little bit. And that is the idea of balanced forces. So let's suppose I have a plain uh, thing. This is not a slope and the weight is downwards. So if the thing is in con contact with it, there will be a normal reaction. In it. And this normal reaction is equal to the weight. So there is zero overall force. So net force is zero because W is downwards and R is upwards. So R minus W is zero. So there is no net force. So the thing does not move. But imagine if I were to tilt this. So I have weight that is still downwards, but now normal reaction is perpendicular to it. So if I were to add these two vectors, I take the weight and then I put a normal reaction there. So normal reactions like this. So you can see that there's going to be a net force that is from the starting point to the ending point. Another way to add this is, this is weight, this is normal reaction, is to use the parallelogram rule. So I have this here, I have this here, and I draw a parallel vector here, I draw a parallel vector here, and then I join the starting point and the ending point, and you can see that there is a net force. And this net force is downward. So no wonder things start to move downwards. Obviously friction is there to stop them. So you might see that, okay, there are cars that are, for example, there's the city, San Francisco, which has really steep roads. So obviously people park their cars over there. So what do we do if you have a slope and you want to park a car there, you apply the handbrake. Handbrake basically creates higher friction. So now, even if the weight of the car and the normal reaction is making it uh, move down. So this is the net force that you have. The friction of the road and because of the handbrake, friction will cancel this effect out. So the car will be stationary because it cancels out. So if you want stuff to experience zero acceleration, which means when you park a car, you don't want it to accelerate. You want it to be stationary. You want the first law to apply then you find a way to make acceleration zero. And how do you make acceleration zero? By making force zero. How do you make force zero? By finding forces that cancel each other out. So always remember this, that if you want things to be stationary or moving at constant speed, or if you find something that is doing that, then definitely, definitely net force is zero because acceleration is zero. If you want things to move, 
Newton's second law applies, and that tells us that you need to create a positive or a negative, but non-zero basically, net force. So if I want the same car to move over here and I want it to move upwards, then what happens? Because friction is a con contact force, and let's suppose I have a slope here. This is a car that I want to move up. So the driving force is forwards, right? There is this normal reaction, there is this weight. What do I want? I want the forward driving force to move the car, but there is still friction, right? So friction is downwards. Now you might argue that why is friction downwards all of a sudden? So remember this thing that friction is a responsive force. Newton's third law tells us that there, is a, there are responsive forces and responsive forces always oppose the forces that cause them. So here, because the car is driving forward, there is a friction being made at a response. And that's why friction is opposing it. If the car suddenly started to come down, the friction will be moving up. Again, because friction is a responsive force. So the nature of these responsive force, we need to know about this. Now, if the car had low driving force and friction was greater, what will happen? What happens if friction is higher? Pelibat friction high ho ni sakti. The maximum friction can be is equal to resistance. Second thing, uh, friction ke saath saath, you also have a force that is net force of R and W, right? This net force. So that is also another force that is being applied on it. So there are two forces pulling the car back. There is one that is friction, which is because of the ground. And the second is net force, which is some of the weight and the normal reaction. Both of those will affect the motion of the car. So if we want the car to stay stationary, what do we want? We want the upward forces to equal the downward forces. So what is an upward force? The driving force. If this is equal to the downward force and what are downward forces? The net force of those two things plus the friction force. If both of them are equal, the car will be stationary, okay? And if somehow your driving force is greater than these two combined, then your car will start to move up. And that is why when you're moving up, up the slope, we usually uh, try to make sure that the car is light, car is powerful enough to do it, and if the slope seems too much for the car, we don't do it. Why would it be too much for the car? Because the net force and the friction combined will be greater than perhaps the force that the car can apply. Okay, so it's important to understand how things move uphill or whatever is happening. But the idea here comes back to Newton's first law that if you want things to be stationary, you want opposing forces to be zero. And that's first law. If you don't want opposing forces to be equal to each other, if you don't want the net force to be zero, you basically want the car to move, which means you want the second law to apply. And whenever second law applies, the net force, the overall force is not equal to zero. So to sum it up, if this is equal to zero, that's first law, things move in constant velocity. So they either stay stationary or they move with constant direction and velocity. If F net force is not zero, second law applies, which means that things will now move. And how will they move? Acceleration will be directly proportional to the force that causes it. And third law applies regardless of what happens. Third law always says that the forward force will have an equal and opposite backward reactive force. So this is a reactive force, okay? And reactive force always opposes the force causing it. So this is third law and it applies regardless of whether you're causing things to move or not, because wherever there is contact, wherever there is two things affecting each other, there will be opposing forces. So we talked about the role of uh, this thing. Now there's a word that we will be using from now. The word is equilibrium. And this word may have different meanings depending on where you study it or what context you have. But the equilibrium in terms of forces is basically that the linear forces are zero and circular forces are zero. Equilibrium kya kehte? Equilibrium hi kehte? Net force 
is zero. That's the first step of equilibrium. You want things to be in equilibrium, you make sure that the net force that they have, the overall force, it is balanced, it is canceled out. There is no net force. So if there are forward forces, they're canceled out by backward force. If there's upward force, it's canceled out by downward force. So you get the idea. We want the net force to be zero if you want things to be in equilibrium. Second thing that we want, if you want equilibrium, is that we want net torque to be equal to zero. Now, torque is a word that we will be introduced to in a while uh, after this topic. So torque is basically when things turn, okay? So the effect of force that makes things turn is torque. So if you don't want things to be moving or you don't want, if you want it to be in equilibrium, you don't want it to move and you don't want it to turn. Only then can we say that this thing is in equilibrium. All right. So two requirements for anything to be in equilibrium. This one, the net force equal to zero is pretty straightforward. And this one, we call it the law of torque or principle of moment. That's what we call it. So it has two words. Either we call it law of torque or principle of moment. In O level or IGCSE, they call it principle of moment. All right. So that is the idea of balanced forces. Now, what about things that actually move in circular? So for example, Earth is rotating around the sun. Is that equilibrium or not? Earth has a constant speed. Do you think Earth is moving when it moves around the sun? It is moving because its forces are balanced or not. So are you saying that if things are moving, like Earth is moving around the sun, then the forces are not balanced. Feel free to unmute yourself if you want to. Yeah, the net moment is not zero. So yes, it is not in equilibrium, very good. So what exactly happens when things move in circle? So whenever things are turning around or they're moving in circle. So when you say that you, you have a road here and a car comes in and it starts to turn around it, it may seem like that, oh, it's just turning around. But actually this turn is basically an arc of a circle. And that circle might be really, really big, but it is still a circle, right? So this car is moving along a circular path. Whenever you turn, you basically move along an arc. And that arc always has a center. So the idea about circular motion that you need to know about is that circular motion always happens because of a centripetal force. Centripetal force. What exactly is centripetal force? Centripetal simply means uh, towards the center. So centripetal force is towards the center. So this is the center of the circle. There is a force that is directed towards the center, which makes things move towards it. So here's the thing. The velocity is always at a tangent to this force. And that's interesting because you know that if force is towards the center, Acceleration is also towards the center. So what happens is that basically, if this is a car and it wants to, uh, let's suppose go in this direction. So it does that. So by the time it reaches over there, the force pulls it back. So now it is moving at this direction. When it reaches here, the car is pulled towards the center again, and now it moves at this angle. And now it's put at the it's pulled at the center again, and now it moves at a, this angle. And now the car is pulled to the center again, and now it moves at a, this angle. So now, so you can see that it's going to ultimately complete a circular path. What exactly is happening is that the velocity. So so in circular motion, the law is that velocity is perpendicular to acceleration, and that holds. So when things start to move like that, what happens? That the velocity is straight, but the, by the time they move even a small distance forward, the acceleration or the force pulls them towards the center a little bit. So the direction of velocity starts to change. So in circular motion, velocity is always having a change in direction, which means that the thing will always be accelerating because remember that acceleration is changing in velocity. 
So even if we say that oh Earth is moving around the sun at 30 kilometers per second or something, I'm not sure what the speed is. But if we say that Earth is moving at a certain speed, then you can easily figure out that even if the speed is constant, velocity is not. Why is the velocity constant? Because the velocity is always seen in direction. So if there is a sun at the center, so this is sort of supposed to be a sun and the earth is moving like this and moves around it in a circular path. Let's suppose it, it is a circular path. Then because the direction keeps on changing, the velocity also keeps changing, even if the speed is constant. By the way, can you figure out what the speed would be? I can tell you that the sun is uh, how many kilometers? 150 million kilometers from Earth. So if you know that, and if you assume that the path is circular, and obviously we know that one year is the time it takes for the Earth to move around the sun, which is equal to 365.25 days. Can you figure out the speed at which Earth moves around the sun in this circle, if there was a circle? So that's your homework for today. Figure this out. You can also go to, I think NASA has a very good website on solar system, solar system .nasa something. So you can go there and you can easily see the earth move like that. So circular motion is when things move using this law that velocity is always perpendicular to the acceleration, which means the direction keeps on changing even if velocity value does not. Uh, Another important thing to remember here is that acceleration is always because of the centripetal force, which means that it will always be towards the center. All right. So balanced forces, as we have talked about, they are when forces are canceled out and this causes a, uh, what you call equilibrium and equilibrium has two reasons. One is we want the net force to be zero and the second one was the net torque to be zero, but we'll talk about torque tomorrow and circular motion is when you have uh, velocity directly proportional to acceleration, I'm oh, sorry, velocity as perpendicular to acceleration and acceleration is towards the center because of the force that causes it is also towards the center. So that's how things move in circle. We don't need to go into much detail of how things go in circle and all that, because that is really beyond the scope of our syllabus. One important aspect of balanced forces is free fall motion or motion in free fall. What exactly is motion in free fall? That if something is falling, so let's assume there is no atmosphere and there is the ground here and something just falls from really high up in the atmosphere. So you have an asteroid that's coming down or you have uh, a daredevil a sportsman just falling from the sky. Okay, sponsored by Red Bull or something. Now this guy is coming down. Right now, let's suppose their weight is, uh, what do you want, to, want them to weigh? Give me a number, 70 kg. Okay, uh, 70 kg can't be the weight. We'll convert it to, uh, so I'll assume it, the person has a mass of 70 kg. So their mass is 70 kg. And just for simplicity, I'm assuming that G is 10. Although the actual value of G is around 9.81 meters per second squared but I'm assuming it's 10 meters per second squared just for simplicity. So now their weight, which is mass into acceleration and acceleration is 10. So it is mg, which is 70 times 10. It is 700 newtons. Thank you, Maheen. Yeah, so this person is coming down with the force like that. So if there is no atmosphere, what will happen? This person has a force and there's nothing canceling that force. There's no upward force because there's no atmosphere. So this person, let's suppose they fall from the edge of the atmosphere. And if I'm not wrong, atmosphere is eight kilometers thick. So up atmosphere to hai to hum atmosphere ki utni hi height se inko jump karwate. So, okay, so atmosphere is nine kilometers at the pole. So let's just let this person fall at the pole. So this is nine kilometers. How long before this person actually falls down and reaches the earth? And we have a very sophisticated landing mechanism. So the person is still uh, safe when they fall. 
So in your exam, uh, 10 is the value that you'll use for O levels, unless they tell you differently. So we'll use 10. Okay, so the distance is nine kilometers and the person is falling, right? And there's a force applying there. So that means force is equal to MA. What force is making them move down? They could just say, ah, the force of gravity is causing them to come down, which is the weight. So obviously the force is 700 and the mass this person has is 70. So acceleration is 10 meters per second. Squared. No wonder this is what we actually started with. That's the acceleration. So this person is accelerating with 10 meters per second squared. What it impl implies is that at time equal to zero. So let's suppose I have time here. So time in seconds and speed in meter per second. So let's suppose this person at zero time, their velocity is zero. So they did not jump actually, they just were left and stranded and they're just coming down. No physical effort that they applied. So it's not like they jumped because if you jump, you actually jump with some greater force or greater acceleration because you jump with the earth or your station, tha, aeroplane, tha, jo bhi cheez thi, usko aapne push kiya. and that push will obviously give you a greater acceleration. So that's not happening. The person is just probably just falling from something and the velocity is zero. After one second, what will the velocity be? 10 meters per second. Why? Because the acceleration is 10 meters per second squared. Every second, the velocity is increasing by 10. After two seconds, the person is falling at a speed of 20. After three seconds, the person is falling at a speed of 30. After four seconds, the speed is 40. After five seconds, it's 50 and so on and so forth. Just to do some calculations, which are not really required for you guys, but can you solve this, this for me? I don't have a calculator. So can you tell me what two times 10 times 9,000 is and take a square root of that? Can you do that please? Four twenty four point six. Okay. Point two six. Okay, so four twenty four point two six. I'll just round it out to four twenty four seconds. Uh, sorry, meters per second. So that is the speed this person would have attained by the time they reach the ground because they are falling in free fall. There's nothing pushing back on them. So 424 meters per second, okay? The fastest free fall that anybody has survived is the speed was 1358 kilometers per hour. 1358 kilometers per hour. Can you figure out if that is higher or lower than this speed? So we talked about it yesterday. How do you convert stuff from kilometers per hour to meters per second? you divide them by 3.6, okay? So can you do this? What do you get? What do you get? 377.2. Okay, so 377 meters per second is the world record for the fastest uh, free fall that anybody has survived. So this person, obviously the person that's jumping without an atmosphere, whoa, they're fa falling at speed that is roughly a, 50 meters per second, more than that. So that's amazing. So this person, how long will it take them to take attain that value? Obviously, because the speed is increasing by 10 every second, I can assume that they will fall in 42 seconds or 42.4 seconds, right? Because of the their speed 424. So this person will keep on falling at 10 meter per second squared, and it will take them 42.4 seconds less than a minute to fall from the, where the edge of the atmosphere is at the North Pole. All right, now let's bring the atmosphere back in. So atmosphere, what does it do? It is a cushion of air. It pushes things that are coming in back, okay? And because, why is it pushing them back? Because Newton's third law. If you push down on the atmosphere and atmosphere is 
a layer of air, which is a fluid. Okay, it has a low density, but it's still particles. So when you push down in them, it pushes back at you because of the third law, which means that when this person starts to come down and they have a weight that is pulling them down, there's a force downwards and it has a speed, that speed will be countered by the air resistance. So there is an air resistance, a force that will be upwards opposing their motion and that is why they will be slowed down. So here's the thing. Instead of falling uniformly like this, their force will start to decrease. So now what happened in free fall without the atmosphere, their weight was 700. Obviously it did not change at all. And the net force was also 700 throughout because nothing was acting down on it. Nothing was countering it. Now let's suppose now we do have an atmosphere and this person is still at a height of nine kilometers and they still weigh the same 700 newtons downwards. But now what's going to happen is that by the time they come downwards, unko opposing force milegi. So the force that they have is weight, which is in newtons. So I should put the unit here somewhere. So newtons, the force is 700. And obviously that's not going to change, but there is going to be an air resistance. That's also in Newton's. So initially when they just jumped, air resistance is zero. So what is the net force? 700 minus zero. Why? Because air resistance opposes it. So this is air resistance. It's pushing it back. So initially there is no air resistance because they just jumped into the atmosphere. So the net force is 700. So let's calculate their acceleration. Now, I think this would be better done if we use Excel. Okay, so we have the weight and we have the air resistance, we have the net force, we have the, what you call, uh, time in seconds, and we have the uh, acceleration, which obviously tells us what the velocity is. So weight is always 700 regardless of what happens. So that is weight. Air resistance initially is zero. Net force is weight minus that. And the time is zero seconds initially. What is the acceleration? 10. Why? Because it is the net force divided by their mass, which is 70. So what is velocity? Velocity initially is zero because they're not increasing. When one second passes, their velocity, so the acceleration is still 10. So it is same thing applied. And now unki speed kya hogi? Ye unki speed hogi. Now after one second, they have attained this value. And now the air resistance is going to push it back. So let's suppose air resistance is 20% uh, of their velocity. So let's suppose it is 0.2 times this. So unki jo speed hai, uska 10% है वो, ठीक है? अब next second बाद क्या होगा? उनकी net force कम हो गई है, ठीक है? जब net force कम हुई है, तो उनकी acceleration भी कम हो गई है, 9.97 पे चली गई है, और उसकी वजह से उनकी velocity में भी कमी आना शुरू हो जाएगी, ठीक है? And now you can fill these values up, and there you go. Let me just round it off a little bit. Okay. So this is how their velocity will start to change. Okay, uh, let me just, okay. So this is how it's going to happen. Eventually what's gonna happen is that the air resistance is going to counter. So air resistance ye thi, two thi, jiski se unki speed net force kam ho gai. Net force kam hoi, unki time kam hoa, aur uski se wo unki speed kam ho gai. Unki acceleration kam ho gai aur ultimately ho we air resistance a little bit. Usually, air resistance is more than that. We give 5 factor. Now, let's see what is happening. This value, the net force, as you can see. Can you all see the graph table? Is it not confusing? The trend that you had to see, that I want you to see is, velocity is increasing. Velocity is increasing. The person is increasing at, obviously, they're falling at a higher pace. But what is happening is, that the acceleration that they have is falling down. If you notice this column, 
their acceleration is decreasing. Why is it decreasing? Because acceleration depends on the net force and net force is continuing to decrease. But obviously we have a very low air resistance. If I increase it a little bit, let's suppose air resistance may be okay? Now what happens? Now this person, after a while, unki speed kam hona shuru ho hai. This is the net force. Air resistance usko counter kar hai. Kam hote ja hai, hote ja hai, hote ja hai. Let's see where, when will, so there's this time that I want it to equal to 700. Okay, so this is interesting. This is where the net force is almost equal to the 700 weight that they have. Weight, who can change you? Weight shouldn't have changed at all. Hold on. All right. So here's what's happening. The velocity, the weight is like this. Or unki speed jo hai, wo usko approach kar Okay. Here's an interesting bit. Coming back from this. Okay. I'm done. Let's see. Shuru mein, unka weight itna hai, air is zero hai, net force zero, 700 hai, time zero hai, acceleration 10 hai, velocity zero. Next one second later, the weight is this, air resistance is still coming up, the net force is 700, one second has passed, their acceleration is 10, velocity is 10. After another second, their weight is this, air resistance is this, net force is less than 700. Why? Because their air resistance has counted it. Time itna ho gaya, acceleration ki kam ho jayegi. Kyun kam ho jayegi? Because it's cancelling out the, because of the net force being decreased, there is a decrease in acceleration. You know second law? There is a decre uh, decrease in the acceleration, which causes the velocity to come down. And as the velocity, uh, sorry, velocity still increases because of accelerate to ho rai. Eventually, what's going to happen? The faster it goes, the higher the air resistance. The higher the air resistance, the lower the net force. Do you follow this? The faster it goes, the higher the air resistance, because air resistance is an opposing force, which means there is a lower net force because net force is weight minus air resistance. And then that net force causes it to accelerate. So their acceleration is coming to, going to come down. So the increase in speed is come less, but they're still moving downwards. So what happens? They keep on doing this. Air resistance keeps on increasing. Eventually, it reaches a value that is almost 700. And obviously, the more time it takes to reach that value, but almost 700 pe wo chali jati hai. And what happens there? It is very close to the actual value that you have seen for the fastest free fall that anybody has survived. The fastest free fall anybody has survived is 377. And this value is pretty close to it. So now what will eventually happen? I'm looking for an interesting trend here. I don't know how long it will take me to find that. Yeah. So here you go. What has happened? The value of air resistance, which is in this column, is increasing, increasing, increasing and reaching almost equal to 700. Now, interesting thing happens to the net force. Net force is almost zero. Okay, this is time. So the net force is almost zero. What happens to the acceleration? You can see that as soon as they are equal to each other, the acceleration has reached zero. So as soon as they're equal to each other, net force and weight, oh sorry, weight and air resistance, net force is almost zero. Acceleration is almost zero, which means the velocity or the speed at which this person is falling will stop to change. So it's almost the same. Malab wo halka sa 0 0.01 may change aata ja rahe, but it's almost fixed to 350 meters per second. And so much time has passed, 321 seconds has passed, or wo 350 pe hi ja rahe. Humne kaha tha ke 422 seconds lagenge is bande ko niche aane mein. Let's see 422 pe kya hota hai. What happens? 422. Ye uski speed 350 pe fixed hai. Aur uski acceleration zero hai. Because uski net force zero hai. Aur uski air resistance is equal to weight. And you can see that air resistance is not changing now. No matter what happens. Because air resistance cannot increase or 
exceed the value of downward force. Why not? Because air resistance is a reactive force. It opposes downward force. So downward weight tha. weight force ne jaise hi cancel kiya uske baad wo rukki. Aur iske baad uski speed kabhi bhi increase nahi kar sakti. 350 is the maximum limit that you can have with this air resistance. It did take a while, like 410 seconds, which means ke ultimately ye banda jab girega, to ye 350 meter per second ki speed se girega. And not just that, notice this velocity. It starts to decrease. Main isko aur chota kar deta hoon just for you to see. You can see that the velocity is starting to decrease and decrease and uh, sorry increase but slowly. पहले वो शुरू में एक सेकंड में दस का फर्क था अगले सेकंड में बीस का अगले सेकंड में नौ का अगले सेकंड में फिर नौ का अगले सेकंड में फिर नौ का फिर नौ का इस तरह चलते 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 अब आप फर्क देखना इन सेकंड में छह का फर्क है इस एक सेकंड में पांच का फर्क है इस एक सेकंड में चार का फर्क है इस एक सेकंड में दो का फर्क है इस एक सेकंड में एक का फर्क है फिर दो का फर्क है फिर एक का फर्क है और इस तरह एक का फर्क चलते 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 वो पॉइंट्स में चेंज होना शुरू कर देगा और ये 336 का 336 के करीब ही ऑब्वियसली इट इज इन सम चेंज इन पॉइंट्स सो इट स्टार्ट्स टू चेंज वेरी वेरी स्लोली द पर्सन इज स्पीडिंग अप वेरी वेरी स्लोली बिकॉज़ उनकी एक्सेलरेशन बहुत थोड़ी होगी आई नो देयर वर दीस आर अ लॉट ऑफ नंबर्स टू प्रोसेस बट डू यू अंडरस्टैंड द प्राइमरी कांसेप्ट है एज सून एज यू स्टार्ट टू फॉल एंड देयर इज एन एयर रेजिस्टेंस you you are still speeding up you are accelerating but the value of acceleration here will start to decrease and as that does the increase in speed starts to decrease which means that overall force will decrease so air resistance usko counter karti jayegi and it will reach a value which is exactly exactly equal to the downward force which was weight ultimately it will reach 700 and at that time velocity will not change you can see this velocity is not changing time is changing this is time acceleration is zero perfect zero q zero hai kyunki net force zero q zero hai kyunki air resistance 700 hai q 700 hai because it's opposing the downward weight 700 this is newton's third law at play and we have achieved a much much lower speed of free fall than what that person was experiencing without an atmosphere and this person is 22 meters per second less speed than the fastest speed people have survived so i'm sure this person has a high chance of surviving this fall and it's all because the atmosphere is acting as a cushion giving air resistance all right